thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come here uh, and speak. I think the last time I was here, uh, it was a nanotechnology conference that I was here for. Um, and I don't even think this, this has been built at the time. So it's fantastic to come and see the facility here today. Um, and I thought the first two speakers were fantastic uh, for giving you a really good overview of innovation and some of the challenges. Um, I was actually delighted that the Russians gave us 2% two, uh, two for uh, innovation because if you look at the Eurovision Song Contest, it's more than normally us for anything else. So actually, I, I, I took heart from the fact uh, that they gave us that. Um, in order to really understand how the future of innovation will drive skills demands, it's quite useful to think about how innovation right now and how what we do right now as an industry drives um, skills demand. And there's some quite interesting um, uh, sort of statistics right now. So in the food industry, um, over the next 10 years, or between 2010 and 2020, the industry needs to recruit 170,000 new people into the industry for jobs. And that's largely because in the UK we have an aging population, uh, we have a very changing dynamic in terms of the types of roles in the industry, and it is becoming increasingly a higher level occupation. You have to have a higher standard of education, you have to be more technically savvy to work in the industry, and we'll touch on that more as we go forward. But there is a very direct correlation right now between innovation and between skills. And I just wondered, does anybody know how many new products, and Andrew, you're not allowed to answer this, because it's just such a weird, yeah. Um, does anybody know how many new products are launched in the UK market? Have you got to guess? Fifteen hundred? I'm now the auctioneer. Anybody else? Any rise in 1,500? 10,000. Who's 10,000? 6 million. Okay, any, any more for any more? 3,000. 3,000? 20,000. Okay, right, let's stop because you've, you've done that thing where you go higher than the real amount and you have to come back. So I think the figures are around about 14,000 in that region. 14,000 new products are launched every year in the UK through the, through the retailers and, and through the out of home marketplace. And every, for every one of those, they have to be, ingredients have to be purchased and checked and quality assured. The product has to be tested and manufactured in a test kitchen, then it has to go into production, it has to be checked, the engineers have to make sure that the machinery can handle it. It has to then go into a fantastic thing called the wobble test, which is where they take the product and they take it around the UK on pallets or they put it on a special machine, machine that checks whether the palletization is robust. Then it goes into supermarket shelves and then it gets sold. So in that entirety of innovation, Almost every single person in the food industry and in the food company is involved in some part in that innovation process. And innovation is the lifeblood of the industry. What drives that innovation, as we've heard earlier, are changing consumer demands. So uh, more portable food, more personal food, health, um, intolerance, allergies, um, and just generally an interest in food and the provenance of food are all giving rise to lots of reasons for innovation. And in addition to that, and as it was touched on by Andrew, uh, packaging is a really, really important uh, reason why there's innovation in new products launched. Um, I wonder if anybody, so a bit of audience participation, uh, wants to know, or can guess in fact, what the biggest innovation in food, as judged by people in the food industry, has been since almost the beginning of time. Do you get any suggestions? <laughs> Great, let's give up. Canning. Correct. If I had a prize, you'd win it. <laughs> Canning is seen as the biggest because of the enormous. Can you imagine a life before tin cans? How did you transport products safely around, particularly liquid products around the kitchen? That has been seen as a really, really massive innovation. And you can only imagine what that did for the sort of how food companies operate and what they needed. So suddenly they needed canning plants, they needed to have a very different sort of set up to how they had in the past. So when we look at the links between innovation and skills, it, it, there's lots and lots of what I call everyday innovation around product. Some of the big changes are around process innovation. Um, and this question about how the industry skills needs to change is something that we've been interested in for, for a long time. So a couple of years ago, we commissioned a report to look at, it was a literature review of the types of technology that were happening and that might come into the food industry. Because you can only start to imagine what those skills are going to be if you can start to talk about the types of innovation that might come through. So we were less concerned, interestingly, with the product innovation, because lots of that product innovation will be driven by consumers, and it'll be you know, product re-engineering, it'll be changing products, changing flavors, um, and sort of incremental uh, types of, of innovation. But we were particularly interested in the technologies 
and what kind of technologies would be coming into the industry. So we looked at it in a number of different ways. The first way, first couple of ways were which ones were available now but maybe haven't been adopted by the UK industries as much as they have overseas, uh, maybe particularly in Russia in the data sector even, um, which would be emerging soon, and that was up to about 2015. Where were there some trials and prototypes, and then looking at the experimental and the really long-term stuff. So the long-term stuff would be maybe um, technologies that are in, in medical or in, uh, in, other, in other sectors that might potentially have an application uh, in, the, in the UK and in the food industry. You'll be delighted to know I'm not going to go through all of them because I have no idea what half of them are. Um, I don't profess to be an expert in technology. Uh, but what we did do is to start looking at where they could be applicable in terms of different parts of our industry. Because as you all know, the food industry is a very diverse sector. We have meat, fish, uh, fruit and vegetables, oils and fats, all of those different parts. So we started to look at different types of technologies and where they might be relevant for the future. We did that both in terms of these are some of the shorter term ones, I think available sort of in the next few years that have been used elsewhere. But then we went into this fantastic thing, including continuous oscillatory battle reactor. Uh, and there is a prize if anybody has a clue what that is. Um, but that's sort of from 2025 onwards, uh, the type of innovation that we're looking for. Um, so that gives you an idea of kind of the breadth and the time span that we were looking at to try and understand better what those kind of impacts would be. What would it mean for food companies to be dealing with this kind of technology? Well. What we identified is there are probably four main roles, everybody's going to be impacted, but four main roles that are going to be significantly impacted in terms of the skills that are going to be needed for the future. Um, and this is very simplistically kind of uh, condensed a rather large report into four main roles, but it is these types of roles that are going to be really, really important. One of the things that we've witnessed over the past probably 10 years is that the role of a factory operative, which does not sound like a very interesting role, I have to say, you, know, you have a potentially a stereotype of somebody on a line just doing something monotonously. That role has become increasingly high-tech. It is increasingly about being highly skilled and being able to operate machinery, do routine maintenance, and be able to operate in a way that is not just routine. You have to be well informed, you have to be on the way to being almost uh, as well qualified as engineers are. You have to be able to manage a team of people whilst managing technology as well. And so just to be an operator in our industry is going to be an increasingly challenging role. We've seen already the emergence of skilled and technical operators rather than just sort of manual operators in the industry. So it's going to go more and more in that direction. For maintenance engineers, and a maintenance engineer's job essentially is to keep the plant going. Um, and their role is going to be very interesting because a lot of the machinery is built in fault finding, it has built all sorts of new visual, um, uh, visual systems. So to be able to maintain that breadth and complexity of type of equipment that's going to be coming into the industry will require new sets of skills that will require them to work more closely with those people producing types of new technologies that are coming in. Um, and so you can imagine in 10 or 15 years time, the education you had as a maintenance engineer in, in a college actually you'll need to go through some fundamental retraining to be able to maintain the kind of level of um, awareness and ability to uh, deal with some of the technologies that are coming through. I think also if you're designing a process or even designing a food factory, that's going to be very challenging because what you know now may not be the case going forward. Um, and there are great opportunities to address some of the areas, um, certainly that Andrew talked about, right, about sustainability in how you think about the future um, of design and design skills we have. One of the areas that is, is being looked at right now, for example, is, um, is food factory of the future. And in the past, if you're dealing with a product that needs to be chilled, you would chill the whole factory because people would work in that environment. Whereas a number of people are looking at saying, well, actually, why don't we chill the bit where the product is and keep the people in a nice warm environment? So actually, you have a split factory where you have almost like a tunnel. And I always have a vision of those, you know, those medical things where you're sort of working with gloves in a sort of <laughs> container. But the food comes along there, and you're nice and warm on the outside, and the food is maintained. And you can imagine what that might do in terms of energy usage. So you're not having to keep the whole place down to a particular temperature, improve the working environment for people working um, in the industry. So already there are changes coming through. And that means more creativity will be required, but it also means more understanding of some of the risks attached to some of these new technologies that are coming through. And then we've got food scientists and technologists. And you know, when you think of the application of, of uh, food science and technology and, and how every single one of these will have to be assured for safety, 
it'll have to be understood in terms of the impact of quality on product, um, the raw ingredients and how they come through and how they operate in a factory and what it does to the raw ingredients, the taste and the sensory um, um, qualities of the product are going to have to be understood. So a lot of change for those involved in food science and technology. And again, those who might be doing degrees of studying food science and technology now are dealing probably with the known now, but in 10 years' time, some of these technologies will come in and mean we have to keep constantly uh, up to speed with those innovations that are coming through. So one of the challenges that we have is that we're going to need more engineers and we're going to need more food scientists. So there's a little bit of a challenge to the industry right now, and in fact, a, a more general challenge, in that if you look at food and drink engineers, we have a really high demand across the whole of the UK in all sectors for engineers. So currently, there's a demand for about 87,000 graduate engineers in the UK, and we currently are um, having a supply of 46,000 graduates across all industries. So that's not just food and drink, that's across everywhere. And at apprenticeship level, for roles like some of the maintenance engineering roles, there's a demand for about 69,000 a year, we're only, doing 20, but we're only training about 27,000. So you've got a real challenge, which is that, right across the board, there aren't enough engineers to, to operate in all the different sectors, whether that's automotive, aerospace, etc., etc. But in the food industry, we've got an extra challenge in that we're not necessarily seen as a sector which engineers would readily go to. I think they tend to be more interested in fast cars, um, you know, in more sexy industries where they don't necessarily see food and drink as being a particularly uh, a career of choice for an engineer. Also, when we look at in the past some of the uh, challenges around the training that's gone on for engineers, a lot of the, the apprenticeships that have been designed have been designed for companies and maybe the, the uh, automotive industry. We haven't had actually programs that have been designed more for the food industry at all. So we've had an element of substandard delivery of apprenticeships. So some, some companies will tell you that they'll take an apprentice who's been trained, but they might be trained by, trained by Rolls-Royce in heavy engineering, they come into the food industry where they have to maintain, they have to know electrical, mechanical, automotive systems, they have to have a broad understanding of all those different technologies, et cetera, et cetera, and they'll say that they end up having to retrain them because they don't have that breadth of knowledge. So to a certain extent, and this is a, this is a company view, this is part of a, a sort of vision from a number of food companies, it's sort of, we need to be better at marketing the whole of the industry, but we also need to be better at marketing the career opportunities that there are for engineers in our industry, and trying to inspire more of them to come in and study, and to make sure that the programs that are available to study are much more relevant to the food industry. Um, one of the solutions for, um, for looking at the area of food science as well is that in food science we've got another challenge and that challenge is the shortage of food scientists in the industry. So currently one in four vacancies are not filled, food scientists. And it's interesting because if you ask a company, how many roles do you have called food scientists? It's only they don't have very many. But if you ask them how many people work in quality, um, in product development, in all of those areas, they'll tell you a very, very different story. So there are over 30 universities offering programs in food, in food science. But actually, when we look at how many people go on and do further study, or those who are overseas students will return and do so in the UK, we end up with a very complicated mathematical formula that ends up with around about 300 people a year coming into the food industry. And that's not enough. We need lots more people coming into the industry to study food science and technology. Because all of this innovation that is required in the industry, whatever it is, whether it's 14,000 products that are coming through, or whether it's some of these technologies, are really, really vital. We did a survey of all the universities, um, and one of the questions that we asked around food science and technology programs was how sustainable are your university degree programs? And actually about a third of, uh, of the universities said that they could see a situation where their provision would be unsustainable in the future because not enough young people are coming through to study food science and technology. And they're absolutely reliant on a number of overseas students coming, they're absolutely reliant on a core of very, very good lecturers and professors who are retiring in the future. So we have a real issue about the challenge around about how will we sustain the skills that the industry needs and how can we encourage more and more people to come through into the industry. One of the ways we can do that is get the industry geared up to work together. So some of the solutions that have been developed, and these have been developed by the industry, are looking at how we can have really clear progression rooms. So you might come in here at a, at a level two or a level three looking at an engineering apprenticeship. 
Where do you go next? What's your career progression? And how are those programs being informed by some of the innovation that's happening in some of those leading companies? And so the industry's got together and uh, particularly in, on engineering, come up with the very, very first engineering uh, master's degree, um, which is, as I say, it offers work placements by the industry. And what they realize is that the industry needs to collaborate to build scale so that they can encourage more young people to come into the industry and to take up careers in engineering and food, food science and technology. When we look at the dairy industry, some of the work that they've done around collaboration, it's very interesting. In fact, um, six, seven years ago, they got together and recognized that um, they had a real problem with the kind of training that was being done for their people just to operate the process of uh, producing milk. So in, in 2007, they got together and all the various companies decided they would pool all of their learners together to build scale so that they could develop a foundation degree in dairy technology. And that's been running for the past six years. There are about 25 students a year. So not a huge number, but 25. If every single company tried to do that individually, they would be going to their local college or their local university with three learners or four learners. But by building scale, they've been able to come together and start to address that. And the impact that the people are having in their businesses are quite phenomenal in terms of cost savings, um, products coming out, the quality of the product, and how those businesses are being run is really, really impressive. So there are solutions out there around about how the industry can work collaboratively to address some of the issues. Overarching all of this is a need to try and encourage more young people to come into the industry and see it as a really good place to work. And ourselves, along with people like the FDF and others, have been doing a lot of work to campaign and to go to conferences, to go to skills shows, to try and encourage young people to consider the industry as, as a career choice. So this is just a, a very simple example of sort of a Tasty Careers map where we show all the variety of the different roles that are in the industry. And what we're starting to do map now is to map over the career progression and how people can uh, learn and what qualifications and what experiences they can have in order to become a technical manager or a finance manager in the industry. Some of the other things that we're doing with the industry is to try and encourage this more professionalizing of the industry, is to try and define for the industry what best in class looks like for some of the job roles we've talked about. So we've talked about a maintenance engineer or a quality assurance manager or a technical manager. How would you know what it is to be excellent in that role? And so we've been working with a number of companies over the past two years to define not just what it looks like to be competent in those roles, to look at what it needs to be, means to be excellent. And on that excellence uh, category, one of the key areas that we're looking at is that technical knowledge that you will have. So to be excellent, part of it is about understanding how some of these new technologies are going to come in and affect your industry and your products. So you can see this is, a, this is an example of a continuous improvement manager. You can map those kind of competencies around about technical, attitudes, behaviors, functional skills, and leadership and management skills. And if you think about the complexity of the industry, from everything you heard about Andrew, from Andrew and from Nicole and from myself, you know, the skills in terms of leadership and management that you need just to be able to run the business in this complex environment are quite incredible. So we're starting to be able to help companies to map what that looks like in terms of continuous improvement and leadership and management. And we can also start to look at um, the different areas that, that you might have in a company and how, if you're producing one product in one company, what those particular competencies need to look like as opposed to another. Now, apparently, uh, this, this has been done on me, although um, I'm not sure it's a very good indication of my uh, technical competence whatsoever. Um, but you can start to map somebody's competence and, and, and ability and, uh, around about those different areas. So what we're doing is trying to support the industry to start professionalizing, because if you can describe what it looks like to be excellent, you've got more chance of embracing some of this innovation that's happening and making sure that your people have the right skills. That's it. Just perhaps a quick question before coffee. I've listened to what you said, and I come from the industry myself, so I, I accept a lot of what you said in the of track people in the industry. But as a challenging question, either to you or to the academic members of the, the audience, we, we have to not lose sight of the fact that we need the, the researchers do fundamental food science. And what I mean by that is food science that is on the face of it utterly useless. So that people in the science field will then be able to pick it up in five, 10, or 15 years down the time and then get the aha type discovery of it. And then you'll get to see 
real innovation being driven forward in, in the long term. What sort of systems are in place within the UK to uh, secure fundamental food science research so that we can both nurture the people who want to come into the industry as you're advocating, but also the, the first class researchers that are, are going to try and teach you forward? Does anybody else want to answer? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> <Brilliant>. <laughs> uh, I think I think the um, the subject of food science is a really interesting one because I think I think you've got a couple of challenges around there. I, I think that there is a lot of uh, support, and I think governments have kind of slightly woken up through something called the agri tech strategy to say, do you know what? We need to be investing money in supporting innovation and actually supporting more applied innovation as well in terms of how can we uh, use innovation to drive. Um, better yields um, and to, to drive better performance in the industry. So there is quite a lot of um, finance available for companies to do joint research, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I think one of the challenges is when, when government turns around to industry and says, so what do you want to do with it then? That's where you start to have a, a bit of a challenge. And there's been an awful lot of work done in the last couple of years to try and develop more of an industry strategy for innovation. So if water is going to be a big issue in the future or sustainability is a huge issue, what are those areas that should be being focused on around about sustainability that might deliver the kind of benefits? And I certainly know that the FDF have been at the forefront of developing an industry strategy, uh, which is why I was desperately looking for Andrew for some help on this one, um, because that, that is very much around some of the big industry areas of breakthroughs that are needed, I think. So I think there's money out there. I think there, uh, there are a number, you know, quite a high proportion of people studying food science and technology stay on and do masters. That's one of the reasons we don't have enough coming into the industry, which is a good thing in a way, because they're then developing of that research base, um, but I think uh, I, I think overall there is still a little bit of a, a, a lack of real understanding around the value of science and science's application into food. And the reason the reason I ask, sorry, the reason I ask is that there are a lot of models going around in, in Europe with the, the food cluster in Bagley, which is seen as a, a very very good place to be, and I'm sure it is. There's a food cluster about to be developed in Denmark, and there's probably food clusters being developed in in, in the UK. Yeah. And they are excellent facilities for the interface between academia and business. And in order to get the funding, you have to have a commercial uh, benefit or a commercial application. What we shouldn't lose sight of, despite the fact that I come from the industry, is the fundamental research that takes place within universities to actually drive that forward. And that, there should, that should be done out with the cluster. Yeah. And I don't know how much availability there is. I think also, I mean, I, I sat on a, 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 a university sort of panel the other day where, um, where because we have a food innovation uh, group, uh, what happened is that was the spur for the university itself to talk to its different departments. And what came through was actually from the four different departments who came and presented to us, the spark that I didn't know you were doing that. And actually that could be, so even within one university, and I don't know whether you'd, you'd agree with this, but that actually there can be phenomenal activity being done. Somebody was looking at um, something to do with blood, differently. I can't tell you more about it, but they were doing how blood flows. Now the, the immediate um, observation from somebody else was how that blood flows and how you map that could have an immediate impact over in dairy for how milk flows. So completely different, but actually that's the spark that you're looking yeah, for. Exactly. And I actually think sometimes universities could encourage those different functions to come together and do a bit of a, a sort of challenge around about how some of the projects that they're working on and some of the fantastic capability that's there can be harnessed to bring those breakthrough ideas for the food industry. Yeah.